Today we will learn and reflect on St. Justin's apology to the Senate during the reign of Emperor Marcus Aurelius. What can we learn from this apology? St. Justin Martyr demonstrates how both the Old Testament and the Greco-Roman moral philosophers both point to and are fulfilled by the coming of Christ into the world. St. Justin also retells an entertaining dialogue from Xenophon between Hercules and Lady Virtue and Lady Vice. And the conflicts between virtue and vice is a favorite topic for both Stoics and Christian monastics. We always like to quote from the works we're discussing. At the end of our talk, we will discuss the sources we use for this video and my blogs. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. Justin's second apology to the Roman Senate was written to protest the persecutions against the Christians in response to the accusations made by the Cynic philosopher Crescens that the Christians were atheists impious to the traditional pagan gods, and this accusation would eventually result in St. Justin's martyrdom. St. Justin praises the moral philosophy of the Stoics, but insists that Christianity is the true and complete philosophy. Justin says this, I confess that I am proud to be called a Christian, and with all my strength I strive to be one, not because the teachings of Plato are so different from those of Christ, but rather because they are not in all respects similar. The same is true with regard to the others, the Stoics, the poets, and the historians. For each man among them spoke well according to the degree that each one had a share in the spermatic logos of Christ. Whatever correct teachings all men have promulgated, these are the property of us Christians. For next to God, we worship and love the Logos, who is from the unbegotten and ineffable God. Since he also became man for our sakes, so that, becoming a partaker of our sufferings, Christ might even bring us healing. St. Justin teaches us, Our doctrines appear to be greater than all human teaching, because Christ, who appeared for our sakes, became the whole rational being, both body and reason and soul. Whenever lawgivers and philosophers uttered truth, this was an elaboration of what they found in some part of the word of God. But since they did not know the whole of the word, which is Christ, they often contradicted themselves. In other words, Christ makes philosophy perfect. St. Justin compares Jesus to Socrates, who is accused of the same crimes as the Christians, being accused of atheism and impiety and corrupting the youth. The Greeks accused Socrates of introducing new deities and did not consider those to be gods that the state recognized. In the Republic, Socrates cast out from the state both Homer and the rest of the poets and taught men to reject the wicked demons and those who did the things which the poet related. Socrates exhorted them to become acquainted with the god who is to them unknown, which is what St. Paul likewise said to the Athenians in the books of Acts when he passed by an altar to the unknown God, which he said was the God of Israel. St. Justin shows that Christ is superior to Socrates, for no one trusted in Socrates so as to die for his doctrine, but in Christ, who is partially known even by Socrates, for Christ was and is the Word who is in every man and who foretold the things that were to come to pass, for not only philosophers and scholars believed in Christ, but also artisans and people entirely uneducated, despising both glory and fear, and also death. And since he, Christ, is the power of the ineffable Father, and not the mere instrument of human reason. St. Justin shares this thought with Epictetus, the Roman Stoic philosopher. When we imitate Jupiter and the other gods and sodomy and shameless intercourse with women, might we not bring as our apologies the writings of Epicurus and the poets? Epictetus was known to despise the Epicureans. The early church fathers, including St. Justin, did not deny the existence of the pagan gods, but rather saw them as demons active in the world. But Jesus was mightier than Socrates, whereas no one trusted in Socrates so as to die for his doctrine. Many willingly believe and are martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. In the chapter on how Christians view death, Justin illustrates with a story related by Socrates in the Moralia of Xenophon. This is such an interesting story that it will quote both Justin's retelling and compare it with the original story in Xenophon. In Justin's retelling, Socrates tells us of the story of the hero Hercules as he meets the two ladies, Lady Virtue and Lady Vice. 
Hercules, coming to a place where the three ways meet, found virtue and vice, who appeared to him in the form of women. Vice in a luxurious dress, and with a seductive expression, blooming from her exquisite dress. Her eyes, betraying a quick melting tenderness, said to Hercules that if he followed her, she would always enable him to pass his life in pleasure, and adorned with the most graceful adornments. But Virtue, with a squalid look and dress, said, If you obey me, you shall adorn yourself not with ornament nor beauty that passes away and perishes, but with everlasting and precious graces. In Xenophon's original version of the story, these two women, Virtue and Vice, seem more like cousins, uh, but uh, their appearances are not so different in St. Justin's remembering. St. Justin, in his retelling, says, Everyone who flees these things that seem to be good and follows instead those things that are difficult and strange to this world enters into blessedness. For vice, by imitating what is incorruptible, for what is really incorruptible she neither has nor can produce, Lady Vice has painted her own actions as a false image of virtue, and she leads astray her captive earthbound men, misrepresenting as virtuous her own evil deeds. Xenophon Socrates tells us that when Hercules was setting out from childhood to manhood, when the young become independent and choose whether they will follow the path of goodness or wickedness, he went to a quiet spot and sat down considering which way he should take. He was there, he saw two women approaching them. Both were tall, but one was handsome in appearance, with a natural air of distinction, clean-limbed and modest in expression, soberly dressed in a white robe while the other was well fed to the point of fleshiness and softness, her makeup resulting in a complexion too red and white to be real, with a carriage more upright than was natural, with a brazen expression, and robed in a way that revealed as much as possible of her charms. Lady Vice kept examining herself and watching to see if anyone was looking at her, and then glancing at her own shadow. In the time of the ancient world, it was considered sexy to be a little bit chubby, because that meant you were well fed. The lady virtue of Xenophon Socrates is elegant, with a genuine noble character, whereas the lady vice is plump with a pretension of nobility, but who masquerades herself as a cheaper and less secure virtue. Lady vice is an Epicurean. She thinks that pleasure is the primary virtue of life. Xenophon Socrates has a lady vice eager to rush ahead of virtue, running up to Hercules saying, Hercules, I can see that you can't make up your mind which way of life to adapt. If you take me as your friend, I will lead you by the easiest and most pleasant road. You will not miss the taste of any pleasure, and you shall live out your life without any experience of hardship. Which kind of sounds what, like a lot of Christians pray for in this world. When Hercules heard this, he asked, What is your name, lady? And she replied, My friends call me happiness, but people who don't like me nickname me vice. And as an aside in these ancient stories, the names of the characters are very important. Lady Vice would have us believe that the good is really bad and the bad is really good, and that which leads to misery, Lady Vice labels as happiness. Xenophon Socrates continues the story as Lady Virtue comes forward to address Hercules. I know your parents, and I have carefully observed your education, and this leads me to hope that you may mature and perform many fine and noble deeds and that I may win greater honor still, and brighter glory for the blessings I bestow. I will not delude you with promises of future pleasure, but I shall give you a true account of the facts, exactly as the gods have ordained them. And Lady Virtue continues, Nothing that is really good and admirable is granted by the gods to men without some effort and application. If you want the gods to be gracious to you, you must worship the gods. If you wish to be loved by your friends, you must be kind to your friends. If you expect to be admired for your fine qualities by the whole of Greece, you must try to benefit Greece. If you want land to produce abundant crops, you must look after your land. And if you expect to profit from the sale of your livestock, you must take care of your animals. If you want to be physically fit, you must train your body to be subject to your reason and develop it with hard work and sweat. And what makes the original story better than Justin's remembering is how virtue upbraids vice. Lady Vice breaks in, do you realize Hercules, what a long and difficult road to enjoyment this woman is describing to you. I'll put you on a short and easy road to happiness. The Lady Virtue responds, Impudent creature, Lady Vice, what good have you to offer? And what do you know of real pleasure, you who refuse to do anything with a view to either? You don't even wait for the desire for what is pleasant. You stuff yourself with everything before you want it, 
eating before you're hungry, and deep drinking before you're thirsty. To make eating enjoyable, you invent refinements of cuisine. To make drinking enjoyable, you provide yourself with expensive wines. You force the gratification of your sexual impulses before they ask for it, employing all kinds of devices and treating men as women. This is the sort of training that you give your subjects, exciting their passions by night and putting them to sleep for the best part of the day. And the Socrates of Xenophon is more stoic and more concerned with morals than is the Socrates of Plato. The idea that you need to discipline your body to save your soul is a theme in both Stoicism and in the monastic writings of the early church fathers. Lady Virtue continues upbraiding her cousin Lady Vice. Who would trust your word? Who would assist you if you needed someone? What same person would join your devotees? When your followers are young, they are feeble in body, and when they are older, they are foolish in mind. They are maintained in their youth in effortless comfort, but past their old age in laborious squalor, disgraced by their previous actions, and burdened by their present ones, because in their youth they have run through all that was pleasant, and laid up for their old age what is hard to bear. And this diatribe reminds me of commentary by the psychologist Scott Peck on the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. If you remember, this is the parable where the ten virgins waited with their lamps for Christ, the bridegroom, to appear at the wedding feast. And the parable tells us that the five wise virgins brought along an extra supply of oil, while the five foolish virgins only had the oil in their lamps. And we read in the scriptures thus, At midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some oil for yourselves. And while the foolish virgins went out to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came, also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly, truly, I tell you, I do not know you. And Scott Peck said that the parable struck me as totally unchristian. What on earth is Christianity about if it isn't about sharing? But I had to give a sermon on the parable, it mean, which meant I had to think about it. Sometimes it's quite remarkable what can happen when we think. I realized that the oil in this parable was a symbol for preparation. What Jesus was saying to us is we cannot share our preparation. You cannot do another's homework for them. Or if you do their homework, you cannot earn their degree for them, which is a symbol of their preparation. The only thing that we can do, and it is often very difficult, is try as best we can to impart to others a motive for them to prepare themselves. And I know of no way of doing that other than attempting to teach them how important they are, how beautiful and desirable they are in the eyes of God. Scott Peck is obviously sharing the frustrations all parents feel when they think their children are going astray, not putting forth their best efforts at school, caring only for the pleasures of partying and their friends, blindly ignorant of the misery of the future when they can't get a good job because they don't, don't have a marketable skill or a meaningful education, as well as our own misery when we do not plan for the future and only live for the weekend and today's pleasures and partying and drinking and dancing and such. The more spiritual interpretations of the early church fathers of this parable of the ten versions also illuminates Socrates' story about the lady's virtue and vice. Like Lady Virtue and Lady Vice, the five wise virgins do not appear to be that different from the five foolish virgins. St. Augustine teaches that the number five refers to the five senses, and that whoever abstains from unlawful seeing, unlawful hearing, unlawful smelling, unlawful tasting, and unlawful touching, is by reason of blamelessness, is here called by the name of virgin. The oil represents charity, compassion, and love for God and love for our neighbor. All ten virgins slept before the bridegroom came, so what was different about the five wise virgins? No coldness of love crept over them, and them love did not grow cold, and because their love glowed even to the end, therefore the gates of the bridegroom opened up to them. Lady Vice deceives us into believing we should not prepare and that we should benefit from the labor of others. Likewise, St. Augustine teaches that the five foolish virgins did the same. And when their lamps began to fail, they pleaded with the five wise virgins, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are going out. They sought for what they had been most prone to seek for, to shine with another's oil, to walk after another's praises. As Christ exhorts us in Matthew, He who endures to the end will be saved. 
And Xenophon Socrates has Lady Virtue concluding her address describing what is true and everlasting, that happiness that we should work towards, not the transitory happiness of Lady Vice from drinking and dancing and slothful habits. My friends can enjoy food and drink with pleasure and without effort because they abstain until they feel a desire for them. Their sleep is sweeter than the sleep of the easy living. Neither guilt nor regret keeps them awake at night. Lady Virtue continues, The young enjoy the praise of their elders, and the elders are happy and respected by the young. They recall their past achievements with pleasure and rejoice in present successes, because through me, Lady Virtue, they are dear to the gods and loved by their friends and honored by their country. There, Hercules, said Lady Virtue, child of good parents. If you work hard in the way I've described, you can possess the most beatific and lasting happiness. Now we will close our discussion by this quote from St. Justin Martyr. What led Justin to convert to Christianity? He tells us, When I was delighting in the doctrines of Plato, and heard the Christians being slandered, and saw them fearless of death, and that they feared nothing, I perceived that it was impossible that they could be living in wickedness and pleasure. Yeah, we'll, we'll discuss the sources uh, we use for this video. My main source for J St. Justin Martyr is the Anti-Nicene Fathers, uh, Volume 1. We have a deeper discussion of the manuscript history and the sources used in the video and Justin's apology to the Emperor. I have serious reservation about some of what Scott Peck has written, but we can learn important life lessons in these two books that I quoted from. And we recommend that you purchase the Christian Book Distributors ebooks for the Anti Nicene Fathers. These books are no longer in print and hard to find, and this is the only edition that includes both the introductions and the footnote. And we go over some of the other sources we use Eusebius, which was the ancient historian, uh, history by Goodspeed and Jaroslav Pelikan and Hebrew Chadwick and McGuckin. And here's the thumbnail that we put for our video. If you wish to purchase any of these books from Amazon, please use the links in the description to support our channel, and please subscribe to our channel. And please click on the links for interesting videos and other topics that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.